Hey guys, what's up? Zooch here again. I'm bringing you the second installment of my Nine Moons Invitational video series. If you missed the last one, it was my match against No Way It's Jay in the quarterfinals. Uh, you can find a link to the video in the description below, or I don't know, somewhere here on YouTube, you'll find it. Uh, <laughs> this is match number two, the semifinals against Zane. Um, for those who didn't watch the first video, this is a invitational tournament where we each brought four generals and got to ban one of our opponents. Uh, I believe that I banned my opponent's Argeon and that he banned my Cassivia. So that means that my generals for this match are Vath, Argeon, and Fae. Why don't we jump into game number one? All right. Starting off on the left side, kind of unfortunate. Uh, I think this is a pretty easy throwaway, both of these and Feebles. I'm not going to need them early on. Uh, they're not great in this matchup that has only a few key threats. I, I don't know. Maybe it'll be fine, but uh, I don't actually know how they work with Juggernaut. So, like with Zeal, this makes a Silver Guard Knight like a 3-1. So, I'm not actually sure, but we'll see. Yeah, I can get rid of both of these bad boys. Hopefully we get a 2-drop, or at least a Corona. <laughs> All right, here is a tough decision for me. Normally, I would just be fine running this Flame Blood Warlock out, but with Sphere of Darkness as one of his potential plays, uh, it feels like a pretty backbreaking play to me, especially since they run so much healing in the stack. I think I'd probably try to, in retrospect, what I'd try to do is throw away this Alcuin Lore Master, try to find another two drop, and if I don't, put this Flame Blood Warlock down. Well, we'll see what happens. Maybe I keep the Alcuin, I don't know. Oh, I get rid of the Chromatic Cold. Eh, probably should have kept that. But I'd rather, th yeah, I guess I would prefer to throw this down instead of the Heart Sister. I don't know, this is such a valuable minion in this matchup when you can, like, use it to Warbird things. All right. Yeah, like, this is a pretty, kind of a blowout. Not really. I basically dealt three damage to myself for no reason, but... We traded a card for card, that's about it. Alright, this is kind of nice. I get to use Tiger to kill this, so um, I'm blocking the mana tile here. I didn't really have another play. I guess I could have frigid coroned it, but that seems like sort of a waste. And that does set him up for Warbird if he wants to come get a mana tile. Abyssal Crawler, okay. Healing Mystic. Alright. I throw away the Alcuin here, but I feel like I should have uh, kept it for over the, uh, I don't know, something. Maybe the Corona. Anyway, I think this seems pretty evident. I'm going to be playing the Spelljammer, and then I'm also going to be playing this Blood Tear Alchemist. And then the question is, well, what am I killing, right? Am I killing this 2-1, which can kind of get out of hand and be really obnoxious? Or am I killing this Healing Mystic because it's right next to the Spell Jammer and I don't want it to die from like two attacks and a, and a ping? So um, ultimately, I think I'm going to go ahead and clear this Healing Mystic. And then the question is, well, where do I put the Spell Jammer and the Blood Tear Alchemist? Um, I think I actually mess up this order. I think I'd like the Blood Tear Alchemist down here and the Spell Jammer here so that the Spell Jammer can come up and attack the general if need be. So this was a little bit of a misplay on my part, but not the end of the world. Oh, actually, I killed this thing instead of doing what I just talked about. I think I probably should have killed this healing mystic, but I don't know. Yeah, that was, a, I think, a mistake. So I think I should have... I didn't obviously expect this, but yeah, I think I should have cleared this out of the way um, while I had the opportunity. That doesn't change a whole lot. It just means that I can run away this turn instead of having to kill this at, or like ping it or something like that. I don't know. Because he could have just come up and killed the uh, the blood tier, right? With his general. <laughs> this is a pretty nice warbird. Warbird. 
So right now I feel okay, right? I put my opponent to 19. I, I don't think I... Okay. I like this. We, we're, we're doing okay. We've got a lot more cards than our opponent does. Not anymore, but we did a second ago. <laughs> and then he casts an ooze. All right, so my immediate thought here is Scorn lets me kill a whole bunch of stuff if I like Chromatic Cold, the Ooze, and then Scorn. I can trade so many resources in for... I trade my two resources for these two guys. I get a 4-4 on the board and get to come over and attack him, which seems okay, honestly. Um... It might have been wise. I, I assume that he's got Kailano just in the next couple of turns because that's how this usually plays out. So I either have to like put a lot of pressure on right now or try to control the board as best as I can. I, I think my strategy should have been try to deal as much damage as possible, but this hand doesn't really lend itself to it. So Chromatic Cold, play the Scorn here so it's next to the general and then I get to come over and attack the general <laughs> alrighty yeah there we go so that's one of the worry some parts of playing against like Abyssian and Cassava in particular you know you end up with uh, these situations where you have to kill this or else you just get par get buried in life gain ooze okay so I, I'm my plan here think it's pretty evident um i'm gonna use this frostbow naga to try to kill everything one thing to note uh is that i think i could have i don't know i could have put it next to the ooze right here um the only problem with that is he gets an extra um shadow creep out of it like i have to kill this basically so i have to attack this and then the ooze is going to attack me like, it's definitely going to attack the Naga if I put the the uh, thing right there. Anyway, I decide just to put the Frostbow Naga here, kill this, this thing. I still feel like I'm doing okay here. He's going to go to, I think, 15 here because of the Naga damage and uh, the, my attack damage. And I move over here so that ooze hits me and not, or hits the Naga and not me. Maybe I should have just taken the hit, but I'm at 12, so I think that would have been almost lethal if he had an um, Spectral Revenant. Fancy Blades for zero value. That's a good. I, I guess I inadvertently blocked his Dancing Blades from killing this Frostbow Naga, which was nice. He does get the kind of easy free kill on this heart sister, which is sort of frustrating. Here is a misplay on, on my part. Um, not that right here. I should definitely should not have played this Alcu and Lore Master. It uh, it just dies to a ping. Oh, it's not going. Go. I also think throwing that away was probably a definite mistake, considering I'm at uh, so little life. I did miss up here, because I thought I would have been able to play this Cryptographer as well, but I forgot that I wouldn't get the extra Warbird trigger. I should have played this Frostbone Naga. Um, I would have ended up with the same amount of damage, but I could have dealt more damage. 
uh, the next turn. And my opponent's down to one card in hand. Yeah, that frowny face is me realizing I think I misplayed pretty hard. My opponent has zero cards in hand, so he's he's drawing off the top of his deck. I actually feel okay here, although I do drop to uh, to six, which means that I'm almost dead myself. I have to actually block off uh, my, the opposing general so he can't attack me and kill me. It's a moot point because he ends up drawing a Spectral Revenant, which is kind of annoying, but eh, that happens. I felt this game could have been winnable um, if I had made a couple, maybe a different lines later in the game. Maybe I should have kept that Concealing Shroud uh, near the end there instead of blindly throwing it away. But anyway, we lost our first game. Uh, see you in game number two. I, I went with Faye again, uh, just to get it out of the way. It was the least favorite faction that I wanted to play, so I figured I'd uh, try my hand at just getting it over with or losing quickly. The old turn one Corona play, how annoying. I, I wanted to play that in lieu of playing this Blood Tear, by the way, because I think that there's very little value from playing this with my hand. I didn't have any four drops or anything I was trying to accelerate into. And this is a pretty obnoxious start because it, it ensures you get the almost all three mana tiles. Like, you'll definitely get this one, and you'll probably get these two as well. <laughs> he had nothing. Oh, my gosh. And yeah, so I think at this point I just start uh, getting aggressive. And by aggressive I mean pinging him and then using my warbird, <laughs> but that's about it. <laughs> Am I, even though I he didn't have a turn one play, I, I didn't have a very impressive opener either. Alright, my opponent. Natural selection's my 2-1, so he can come up and kill my 2-2. Two -two. Yeah. Right. Okie dokie. Uh, I had a blood tier alchemist. I think it's pretty obvious that my play here is kill this guy and then play a spell jammer. I um I don't know if there's any inherent uh, benefit to playing it here rather than here. I guess there is, if I play it up here, uh, then if he wants to take this mana tile, he can't come and hit it with his general, so that's fine, I guess. Um, on the other hand, if I play it here, then he, if he comes and plays something with this mana tile, I can hit it with my, with my spell jammer. So I would probably go with here in retrospect, and I think that's what I end up doing. Chai's being a naughty dog. All right, it's a pretty uh, anemic plasma storm, and I'm a little surprised that he attacked me here, considering I've got a lot of probable. I don't know. Not burst damage necessarily. Although I guess he doesn't know my deck, so who knows. So here, yeah, my my only play was to play this big guy and then Warbird. Since it's resetting next turn, I, I really feel like I needed to uh, just eke out as much damage as I could. I could have taken the Mana Tile, um, but that doesn't really do anything for me. And then he can just run up and get away from my scorn. So this way, I give him the opportunity to take the mana tile if he wants it. But I also uh, just, 
I don't know. He could. I guarantee that I can hit him with my my guy if need be. Oh yeah. I don't. I think I got to cast this card once in the whole tournament. All right, natural natural selection on my thing. It happens. There's something to be said for just taking this anyway, since I had the heart sister in hand. Especially since he used uh, he used the mana. No, yeah, he used the mana to full effect. No, he didn't. He didn't need the mana at all. All right, so the play here is pretty clear in my opinion. We're gonna heart sister this uh, chromatic hold it and then warbird it to to kill the guy, deal him some damage. Uh. Alright. And then I think I stay here. I was trying to bait him into moving more into the side so I could get some value from this avalanche. He's so close. I hadn't played it yet. But I assumed he didn't know it was going to be in my hand. I'm really surprised that he didn't run away, like over here. Maybe should have stood right on top of him. Who knows? All right, he just gained life. Oh, <laughs> I steal it. That's right. <laughs> Once again, I am uh, setting this sort of wall to hopefully entice him to run over. Uh, to this side of the board so I can get value from Avalanche. He egg morphs my 3-1, which is kind of interesting. It's basically spending 4 mana to gain 3 life, so a much, much worse uh, Earth Sphere. Alright, so he Tectonic Spikes goes to 11. We actually uh, miss lethal here, so I'll pause it because one of the things that I I tend to think a little bit too much sometimes. Um, I go through a lot of options, and then I end up roping. Um, I don't do that all the time. I do it a lot when I'm streaming, but in tournaments too, I, I tend to like think of what I think the best play is and then try to figure out if there's a better one. So one of the things that I sometimes do is take little shortcuts where I said, like, oh, okay, well, this is going to reset next turn, so from a value perspective... I probably should just use this Warbird right now and then work from there. The problem is that by using Warbird, I put myself at a, this unusual spot where I am just a point shy of damage and then a point of mana shy of lethal as well. So what I should have done, since he's at 11, I have 8 mana, go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, attack 10, 11, and kill him. Instead, I Warbird first, uh... Realize my the error of my ways. And then, because I didn't want to... Um, I, I didn't want to play the Flameblood Warlock. I didn't want to deal myself some extra damage. I just played the Spelljammer. Oh, no, I played the Tiger and Tiger. Interesting. I should have played the Spelljammer, frankly. Just to have the body on the board. That was a mistake on my part. I think I was concerned that if I played this, I would miss out on more card draw for some reason, um, because my hand would be full. But I don't think it matters. I think I'd rather just have the body on the board, and then next turn, even though he's at, he would be at four, I would have seven points of burst in my hand, and I'd have this other th three power body to sort of get some extra points in or something like that, so... I th sort of thought I was eating biscuits here. I thought, like, no way I can lose from this point in time. Um, then he sets this, this little blockade of sorts that gains him a bunch of life, which is just truly infuriating. Right. Oh my gosh, he gains gained up to 15 life. How annoying. <laughs> All right, so I finally get to use Avalanche, even though it's not that great. It it stuns him, and it uh, kills his guy. And then I forget what else I do here. 
I guess I warbird. Like I said, I, I, I would if I can, I want to get as much value from this as I can. So this is almost always going to happen in the late game. So I don't attack here, by the way, because one of the few ways that I die from this point in time, after the seeking eye resolves, uh, is for him to like kill me, which I know it's sort of a uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But uh, one of the few ways I don't win here is if he like just kills me in one shot. And one of the ways that he could do that is like triple thumping wave, right? So if I attack this guy, put myself at sixteen, he could triple thumping wave this guy. Give it 16 power and then kill me. Um, I don't think I need to worry about clearing this guy since I'm going to be focusing all my efforts on killing him. He's already used, uh, I think, all three Azure Heralds at this point in time and, and two Earth Spheres. So the amount of healing that he has left is pretty limited. He's also used, I believe, two healing mystics as well. Um, so I have some, I have the inevitable inevitability on my side. So, uh, I'm not worried about this stupid one for. He said after the match he was one point away from killing me, so I don't know. Maybe I made the right decision there. All right, once again, I should have kept that healing shroud. I think uh, cast it good. So I'm casting the Concealing Shroud, so I, I, I give myself this little buffer. It's going to be great because I'm casting Flame Blood Warlock this turn, which is it's a great little combo. Alright, so I'm obviously hitting him. I'm obviously playing this. <laughs> I get back the Concealing Shroud next turn since it's basically the same as was warbird because it just buys me another turn and here's an important thing to note so i stunned his general um which doesn't seem like the best of plays uh but by stunning his general i'm preventing this one four from killing either of these three ones it can't get to them right he can't move out of the way to let it come up here and kill it he can't come up this way to kill this uh this positioning is pretty important because it stymies his ability to interact meaningfully with the board with his only creature. Alright, Seeking Eye. I kind of want to go back and look at his hand because he, he, what he told me was that it was a pretty close game. Entropic Gaze. <laughs> Like, if he had a Decimus, that would have been four more damage down to 12. Yeah. Okay. Alright, it's so a pretty obvious lethal here, right? Just attack and use my Warbird. Alright. Score is now 1-1. One, one. All right, again, my general that's banned is Cassava, so right now I have Vath, and I've got uh, Argeon as my potential weapons of choice. All right, pretty frustrated with this game, because I think this was easily winnable, and I screwed up. Uh, it's pretty obvious, in my opinion, Earth Sphere has to go, and then also Spelljammer. I don't think I'm casting either of these Spelljammers, because we've seen what his deck does. It just draws a lot of cards. So I probably just want to... Get both of these out of here. He comes up, plays his dumb guy. Okay. So our turn, I think, starts off pretty obviously. Like, we're playing this young Silithar. Uh, and the question is then, well, what do we do with it, right? Just, I'm putting it right here for a couple reasons. So I don't want to put it up here or like over here because I am um, I really want to get some value out of this Dire Tide Frenzy. And if I put it here, I sort of stop him from, uh, 
from moving down onto this mana tile. I don't stop him, but I threaten to like if he if he comes here and then takes his general move sword and puts it here, which is what I expect from him, because that sort of denies me the two mana tiles that I'm sort of contesting. That lets the Dire Tide Frenzy really get really solid value. Um, so I could either put it here or here. And uh, I, I don't remember which was the reason I chose this over, say, this one. Um, if I put it back here, he can't come up and like hit it if he wants to for whatever reason. I don't know. I, yeah, who knows. But this is nice that I'm threatening to, not threatening, but since I have Dire Tide Frenzy, if he like does what I expect, which is come here, move forward, take this mana tile, this is going to be very powerful. All right. Here's a turn I actually mess up, right? So on my turn, I think it's pretty obvious that we're Dire Tired Frenzying this thing and we're attacking this guy with our general to remove the force field. But then what do we do? Uh, what I ended up doing was just greater fortituding this and then smashing one with a five power guy. Um, what I should have done is the following. Uh, I go up to four mana. I should have walked up here, um, flashed out Elucidator onto the mana spring. Then Dire Tide Frenzy did all this uh, and then... I have one extra mana, so I greater fortitude the elucidator and attack him. That takes away this mana tile, and it leaves the most the most important thing is that it leaves this one one body on the board, so that he can't just um, natural selection my guy. I guess he could just attack into it in natural selection, uh, but it sort of turns that card off for a little bit. And I've got two dudes on the board that he has to deal with. I've got a seven two, and a, you know a three two with frenzy uh, and then i've already put him down to 15 life i i know we use almost all the resources in our hand to do that but it still feels like a really good play and it, it has some counterplay to it but i wish i had done that in retrospect this is still a solid play but it, it does get blown out to natural selection among other things i don't know how many thumping waves this deck uses but Whew. More than, more than one, I assume. It, we know he's got egg morph in his deck too. So yeah, he would be at fifteen right now, and we'd have the seven two on the board. How does he even win from there? How does he not just lose immediately from there? Okay. Bonk. We throw away the spell jammer, obviously. We don't need it. Um at this play to me seems pretty obvious. Just uh I mean I guess what I could have done is I don't actually know. Flash elucidator on here, play tiger, pump. So I deal eight, nine, ten, eleven. Wait, no. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. I put him to to nine. It doesn't seem very good. Um, the obvious play, in my opinion, is just play Elucidator, overload, and attack him. So I put him to 13. I still got these two Tigers, and I've got the 5-2 on the board. So he's at 12 right now. I feel pretty good. I feel pretty good right here. Not after that Entropic Gaze, which, by the way, really ought to be changed, but that's neither here nor there. It's one of the cards I really wish they had uh, tested a little bit more. I don't know if, how much they tested it, but... Okay, so this play, I had a lot of options. Um, I have six mana. If I had one more mana, I'd have an easy win where I just flash out my Cantor, thumping wave it uh, to attack for nine, 10, 11, 12. I can put him to one um, by just thumping waving this and attacking with that in my general, which is probably in retrospect what I should have done, but there are a number of things that he could have done to punish me for that. 
uh, he has a lot of life game in the deck, and all of a sudden I'm at 8, so just about anything is lethal here, right? Like, two Entropic Gazes. He's already used one, but two would be lethal. A Decimus plus a Flash Entropic Gaze plus um, Seeking Eye would be lethal. A lot of things he could do here. So I took an approach that uh, was a little more conservative. I put him to nine so that next turn my Flash Macantor Thumping Wave is threatening lethal, or even if it's only going to be, even if he gains a bunch of life, it can at least like clear up his board. I like this move because it puts something in his face. It leaves me sort of in the thick of things, but also with the ability to get the mana tile if need be. It's a moot point because uh, he just straight up and kills me here with this obnoxious bullshit. <laughs> Ugh. Tectonic Spikes basically equates to 9 damage. And then the Seeking Eye ends up killing me. Boo Urns. Maybe I should have... Yeah, I don't know. I could have I could have prevented it by attacking him. Then he couldn't have Tectonic Spikes. But I, there's so many other things that kill me there too. So, I don't know. This is... Uh, Game number four. The score is currently Zane two, myself one. So I like having access to something that can kill a Chakri Avatar on turn one. Um, that can be either Saber Spine Tiger or Magnetize, but I probably don't need both, right? Uh, so I'm going to get rid of one of them. And I think I could also get rid of this Albi Sage, although I don't think I actually end up doing that. This is not a card I really want to cast in this matchup, so I'm kind of inclined to say I throw it away pretty quickly, but... So, this is just about the scariest start that I could possibly envision, right? I can't move... If I even attempt to move forward, I set myself up to get backstabbed and all sorts of nonsense. So, I do something a little unorthodox. Uh, I just stay on the wall. I'm still threatening this mana spring, so he can get these two, obviously, but then he has to put something here. This is pretty brutal. If he hadn't, um, if he hadn't killed my, my guy, this Ironcliff Heart would have been awesome. Like, just come here, Ironcliff Heart, kill your Katara. Or, I guess, down here, whatever. I'm still running along the back wall because I still don't want to get punished. Um, this is almost immediately going to die, but I think I'm fine with that. Like, all he has to do is attack it with this Lantern Fox, then Phoenix Fire it. I think I'm fine with that, though. I guess I could have moved up one space here and then put the Albi Sage here. Maybe I should have done that. I think in the end it doesn't matter, though. Yeah, he just uh, juxes it away so he can backstab it. So it's kind of a moot point. Ah, so brutal. This is like a master class on how to song high, by the way. Okay. Uh... It's pretty clear from my hand that I've got to deal with this nonsense. Um, putting the Iron Cliff here does that in the sense that, like, I can kill this. This ranged unit can't attack me. Uh, and if he, if he has Killering Edge, he can't just get it on a ranged unit with it. And, ugh. and um, I guess most importantly, this is there are two spots that sort of stop both of these minions here and here. I can't go here, though, because it just gets backstabbed by both of these guys. So I go here, and my plan, since I'll have six mana next turn, is to afterblaze it so I can kill the four wins Magi, and then drop this Scintilla or something else. If I've got uh, a two drop in hand, I can do that, and or in Nexus. And then I stay on the wall. I don't think I leave the wall the entire game. 
I think too many people feel like you have to get off the wall, or like there's some reason you need to leave the back wall, and, it, and uh, I just don't think that's true. You have to be smart about it, but I'm basically not letting him ever backstab me. <laughs> He gets pretty aggressive here by just Phoenix firing me twice. Or I guess once? I don't know. Okay. I throw away the spell jammer. I clearly do not want him to have more cards. Um Well, I think the obvious play is after Blaze to kill this and then play this Silver Guard Knight out to protect myself. As an aside, it's after this, the next turn, well, I'll wait. I move one step closer so that I can potentially make my way over to the general and just attack if need be. Sandbagging one of the Phoenix Fires kills off this thing and then deals me one, puts me to eight. Alright. This the hand's not really exactly uh lined up with the uh, the board. So I already replaced my card and got back a windblade adept. I wanna throw out here though. That if I had drawn or replaced into Divine Bond, he'd actually be dead here, which is incredible, right? I just magnetize uh, Orin Nexusit, Divine Bond to give it 13 more power, to give it 18 power, Roar it to give it 20 power, and then attack him for the win with uh, the Iron Cliff in my general. And it comes out to an exact 6 mana, uh, so we even have mana to spare. That didn't happen, unfortunately, so we're sort of forced to figure out what to do here. Um, I think the obvious play is attack, kill the ranged unit, then magnetize this guy over here uh, to like perfect protect myself, and then go into the corner, play this guy, this guy, and then roar. So give us a little bit of uh, a little wall and get to gain some life. Here we go. So I'm actually feeling okay here. I feel like I'm turning the corner here. He's only got two cards in the sand. We're at five, so we're actually dead to like a killing edge. Uh, oh no, we go to eight here from the scintilla. So we're not dead to killing edge. But yeah, I don't know. So my opponent only has seven mana too, which means he can't spiral me this turn. And if we have, if we draw a D divine bond again, I think he's super dead as well. Maybe, presuming this stays here, which it, spoiler alert, it doesn't. Okay, it's a real shame I couldn't scintilla one more time. All right, these. Doing the old Jux play with Tuskbor. <laughs> oh well. So at this point, I I pretty much see the writing on the wall since he did Heaven's Eclipse last turn. But I can attack this guy, put myself to one, uh, and then play the Iron Cliff Guardian to like perfect protect myself. And he's pretty close to dead again. I mean, if I if I had survived and drawn an, a Divine Bond, he would lose. But well, that's not what happened. Anyway, uh, we ended up losing this match one to three. A little disappointing, especially since I'm. 90% sure I, I could slash should have won that uh, Magmar Mirror match had I gone a little aggressive. I don't know if I was going to beat this Riva deck with either my Voth deck or this deck, but 
who knows? Anyway, well, I clearly didn't beat it with this deck, but <laughs> if there's a game five, my, his Reva, my Voth, I don't know what uh, what the outcome would be. All right, um, that's it for this video, and then I will have the last video up, I guess, momentarily. I don't know. Time is all relative in the world of video making, so see you there, I guess.